everyone, Chris Kresser here with a brief message before we begin the podcast. Imagine a career that draws on your passion for wellness and disease prevention, that harnesses your ability to support and connect with others, that helps you to develop as a person while you help others to do the same. What if you could earn a living while making an impact on thousands of people's lives and even on the future of healthcare? That'd be pretty great, right? Well, that job does exist. It's the job of a health coach, and I believe that health coaches will play a crucial role in the future of medicine, not only in the U.S., but around the world. One in two Americans now has a chronic disease, and one in four have multiple chronic diseases. Chronic disease is destroying our quality of life, shortening our lifespan, bankrupting governments, and threatening the health of future generations. And our medical model is not prepared to address it. Why? Because the only way to prevent or reverse chronic disease is by changing our diet, lifestyle, and behavior. And conventional medicine is simply not set up to do this. Bottom line, we need people who can provide this support to help people make the changes they need to make to save their lives. We need empathetic and compassionate people with a skill for connecting and a passion for change. And my job is to make sure they have all the training they need to do their job so well they will change the future of healthcare. A career as a health coach can be incredibly fulfilling both professionally and personally. It really could change your life and it can also change the world. That's why I'm excited to announce that we're launching the ADAPT Health Coach Training Program. It's a 12-month, 100% online certification that will prepare you for a successful career as a health coach. It includes training in core coaching skills, functional health, ancestral diet and lifestyle, and professional development. And it's unlike any other health coach training program currently available. To be notified when enrollment opens and to learn more about the program, visit cresser.co slash success. That's K-R-E-S-S-E-R dot C-O slash success. Now on to the show. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. I'm really excited about this week's episode. Uh, This summer we spent a week in Park City and one of the main reasons we went there was for our daughter Sylvie to attend a camp at the Another Way Community Center. And this camp included outdoor education and Friluftsliv, which means free air life. We'll be talking a little more about what that is exactly in the podcast as well as mindful horsemanship. And Sylvie just had an incredible time. It was transformative for her and also for us. Can't wait to tell you a little bit more about it. And uh, this week's interview is with Diane Bodie, who's the founder and executive director of the Another Way Community Center. Diane is a teacher, author, and illustrator. She grew up on a working ranch in Northern California during the twilight of Norman Rockwell's America. She was born in 1942 at a time when people were more connected to nature and had learned from old ones who knew the West before the buffalo were gone. She's been working for over 30 years to create bridges between the untamed natural world and the modern technological world, creating patterns of healing and creative expression vital to the developing child. Diane's dedicated her life to creating environments, curriculum, and instructional development materials designed to bring each child's unique magic to full expression within a true community of children and adults. She brings a wealth of knowledge to the classroom from her unique combinations of studies in child development, which included a BS in general elementary education, with a minor in sociology, a master's degree in early childhood education, an American Montessori Society certification, a specialist credential in early childhood education, Uh, She also has training in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. She's a certified professional ski instructor of America. Uh, She's done extensive animal training, husbandry, and partnership, and uh, has a lot of experience in frontier history and Native American traditions. She also is the author of Child-Centered Skiing, the American Teaching System for Children, a a very innovative method for a teaching skiing, not only as recreation, but as a way for kids to connect more deeply with their body and with the environment around them. Um, so I am really excited about this conversation. 
we uh, spent a lot of time at another way when we were in Park City, uh, developed a, a really strong connection with Diane and other people that we met there. And it just uh, really aligns with so many things that I think are increasingly important in this uh, world that we live in today, this modern world where kids are often separated from uh, their bodies. They're, they're disconnected from their bodies. They're disconnected from the natural world. Um, they're disconnected from animals and um, from things that as human beings, we have been part of our lives for the vast majority of our evolutionary history. And uh, I think the therapeutic potential of the program that Diane has put together at Another Way uh, is is really phenomenal. And I'm, I'm really excited about her work and want to do everything I can to um, get it out there in the wider world because I think we need it now more than ever. So I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Let's dive in. Diane, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's mutual. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about your background. I, you know, we had some conversations in Park City about it, and it's pretty fascinating. How did you get interested in horses and in skiing as vehicles for childhood development and education? Well, first and foremost, I was uh, a rancher's daughter. Mm -hmm. So I was raised on a working ranch, and we had mainly uh, horses and dude strings, which riding at, at riding stables. And we also raised sheep and the rest of my family were big cattle ranchers. And so that was my whole life. Mm -hmm. Horses were my life. And um, skiing is something I got into as a teenager and ultimately became a ski instructor. So both of those were a huge part of my younger life. Mm -hmm. And I, the ranch, as I recall, it's, it wasn't far from where I am now, like out in Pittsburgh and Antioch or somewhere. It was there. in Northern California, yes. Yeah, it was a yes. ranch between Pittsburgh and Antioch in the foothills. And uh, there were two old ghost towns behind it, Nortonsville and Summersville, where my mm -hmm. grandfather had been born. Mm -hmm. And my uh, grandfather on my dad's side was the biggest sheep and cattle operation in Northern California mm -hmm. at that time in Contra Costa County. So big ranching. So horses were in your blood, and then you got into skiing really early, but how did that then, at what point did you realize that horses and skiing could play a significant role in childhood development and even in education? Well, I was in graduate school, and um, my degree is in American Montessori in early childhood, and uh, we had to do a synthesis project. And I was up in the mountains of the ski resort, sitting on the deck, trying to get away, trying to figure out what in the world I was going to do for that project, and watching a children's ski class. And I went, oh, my gosh, Montessori, perceptual motor theory, cognitive development, learning theory. I could use skiing as a vehicle to study how children learn. And uh, that was my – I ultimately got – a master of arts so i did a master thesis instead of a synthesis project and the horses and skiing both have the same kinds of things that children learn one is a relationship with the animate world the horse and inanimate world nature and it was skiing and so mm -hmm. those two came together for me and then there was time. a <clears throat> The third element that's really important in your work and your vision, which I experienced when we were with you last week, which was is bringing in the Native American, American Indian traditions as, as part of this framework. So how did you get initially exposed to that and interested in, in including that in this model? Well, th that's a bizarre one because as a child, um, I was absolutely fascinated with Native American. Nobody really understands what that fascination was. Mm -hmm. But so that was there as a child. And then when I came to Utah to do the ski programs here um, for the Professional Ski Instructors of America, mm -hmm. I stepped into the mountain man culture and Native America there, and it activated that whole 
part of my early childhood background. And then I became very much involved with um, Clarence Skye, the, then the executive director of the United Sioux Tribes. And it, the whole philosophy of this started to unfold with Native American education being something that we could absolutely affect in a really wonderful, positive way. So that started to come into it. And originally, it was another way for American Indian education. Right. And then it was implemented here in Park City, regardless of tribal history or national affiliation or color, race or creed. Mm -hmm. So when did another way actually start in its in its, um, you know, embodied form? The embodied form started in 2004. Uh And you have an amazing facility. Um, I it's such a special place. My my whole family was there just so the listeners know uh, in Park City. And one of the main reasons we went was because I discovered another way online and it it brought together so many elements that we are interested in as a family. And for Sylvie, she has a a strong connection to horses, which we're not even really sure where it came from because she didn't grow up around horses, unlike you, Diane. Um, And she is really, really uh, uh, passionate about skiing and she loves native traditions. We've exposed her to those and to see that all in one place was, was so exciting for us. And then when we arrived at the facility, it's really amazing what you've done there. The, the, um, the buildings and just, um, so beautiful inside and so well put together for kids and, um, and then the, the barn and the, and the, the horse area. So how, how did that all come together? It's such a, such a special place. I wanted to duplicate the beauty of the mountain and ranch environments that I was raised in because to me it has to be a total immersion Mm -hmm. into an experience. So with the, and in Montessori also is a very organic feel, very earth connected feel. So I wanted that to be present and so the the whole inside environment is more like a ranch home Mm -hmm. and and then everything i loved about our ranch environment the tack room the log facilities the barns being right there so the children could be doing in in the classroom environment being doing a work in mathematics or reading and then they could come out and work directly with the horses and we would support whatever was happening in math and reading with the experience the child was having with the horse or with skiing. So the Mm -hmm. ski program is there. We have the little um, ski slope and practice environment there as well as the horses. So everywhere the children looked was a little Zen view, the teepees in the back, the old log barn for the frontier skills. The ski hill is there. The horses are there. So it's an integrated whole and more of a total immersion Mm -hmm. experience. And it feels that way. Like my, I I notice we spent a lot of time there, several hours every day. And when I was there, my nervous system just dropped a few levels. You know, I could feel the sense of rest and relaxation and also just the connection um, from being around the horses and being in that space. Uh, and of course, Sylvie just, she was so lit up when she was there and, and, and even just being there for a week, she didn't want to leave. Um, I think, which I think is a testament to what you set up. And, and also it strikes me that, you know, one of the main issues with conventional education, which we can get into a little bit more, but, um, is how disconnected and, and unintegrated, disintegrated it is, um, at the school you mentioned kids can be inside, uh, doing mathematics unit or, or something else on geography or language. And then they can step right outside and the horses are right there. The teepee is there for ritual and ceremony. The tack room is there with these amazing, beautiful saddles that have been, you know, some of which were handmade. It, it, it just feels so real and authentic. And I, I think in today's environment, education environment, that's so needed and so lacking well what was really interesting for me is 
the adults around me modeled the work that I would ultimately do. And what's an issue for the children today is their parents go off to work and they have no idea what they do. And they're in, in an institutional environment where they're not able to connect with the natural world. They have no connection, um, certainly with large animals, which is our heritage. I mean, horses and skiing were once a way of life. They were transportation. Without them, people were in big trouble. Um, But what they get to see here is how to apply everything, and they need to know the basic practical life skills how to tie it how to tie how to put a halter on how mm-hmm. to saddle a horse how to be safe around a horse how to read the language of that horse the same thing with the mountain mm-hmm. the same thing when you're skiing you look at that environment you read it you come to understand what is safe what is not safe and what is your playground right. and it's a-okay and and it's a collaborative thing with the environment and with your colleagues, we work together. Yeah, and kids to have play such a play and work. Mm-hmm. And they have such a, a powerful experience of being in their bodies in both of those disciplines. You know, riding and being with horses, and and being on the mountain, in the snow. And it, it seems to me that, um, you know, the way that most classrooms are set up now, um, there's <clears throat> there's so little of that. There might be like a thirty minute PE uh you know period or like a short recess where they get to be outside and and really uh experience themselves in their bodies and i I can't help wondering if that disconnection from nature and and also um you know disconnection from their their uh, their own bodies is is contributing to some of uh, you know this explosion of of behavioral disorders in kids it's it's really um alarming and going in the wrong direction I'm the horses are a relationship with another intelligent animal. Like we the Native Americans call it we are all related. Mm-hmm. Every pattern affects every other pattern. And children who are studying nature in books are even learning how to ride in an arena going into competitive things. It's a very different thing when you see yourself in partnership. And you also recognize that animal has a language that when we learn it, we can partner on a profound level. Horses are telepathic. So as you come to respect and understand their language, there is a joining on a deep, deep spiritual level. Mm-hmm. Deep spiritual level, and uh, and this they're a bridge to nature. There's an active intelligence in nature. It's a, not a dead, inanimate thing or something that we use as a natural resource. Yeah, yeah. it is intimately related to us. It's seems... intimately related to us, and this relationship. Children, if you look at any of the studies, are socially isolated. Yeah. And these these act this interaction from a place of profound respect, from knowing that we are truly all related, that this brings the children into relationship with one another and with nature. Horses are a bridge to the natural world. It's fascinating to look at in in the big forest, the mother tree. And the mother trees are feeding hundreds, maybe thousands of little seedlings. And there's a communication link between them. And it looks like the mycelium may be one of those. And the children are looking at this saying there's an active intelligence that we are a part of. We're not acting on it. We're a part of it. And that goes right back to we're all related. There's one mind expressing an infinite form and we th- see our these our children. We see ourselves as separate and acting on it, when in fact we're an integral part of it, Absolutely. not separate from it. Absolutely. And children, this whole thing with um, nature deficit disorder. Yes, um, the interaction with the horses and the way it is in a total immersion, it reduces social isolation. 
yeah. and brings us all together, adults, children, animals, nature. And I, I think that the this piece about the horses offering this, you know, kind of deep and profound and reflection uh, of us and how, how that relationship can really give us insight into who we are. I really saw that with Sylvie um, as she spent time with you and did the camp and then the, the lessons with you because um, she's a very spirited kid, as you saw, Diane, and, and an amazing, bright human being. Um, and it was fascinating to me to see that the horse that you paired her with and chose for her, which was also a spirited being, um, a Mustang blood. And it really felt like they, that match, um, was perfect. You know, it was like Sylvie got a chance to kind of see a reflection of herself and experience herself in a different way, riding that horse. And when she arrived, she had only been led on a horse, um, you know, on a trail ride, uh, and, and just led a little bit in the ring. And by the time she left, which was really only, you know, stopped doing it five days later, she was cantering around the ring by herself and going around obstacles and, in in you know, pretty amazing control of the horse. It, it was just remarkable to see that. It triggered her. She's a natural and it triggered all of that when she understood how to communicate with Minnie, who was a full blown Mustang, Northern Ute right. and Nevada. Mustang mm-hmm. and Mayor, who's highly sensitive, very intelligent. And when Sylvia learned how to work with her and see how little she had to do, yes. once she learned the language of the horse, how little she had to do to get that response, and that she needed to be, she needed to be the lead on this, mm-hmm. and she could be once the mayor realized she was respecting her and feeling what Minnie needed to have present, then that mare started to work with her, and Sylvie just started to blossom. Absolutely. Her little petals started coming out <laughs> all over the place. And yeah. she could she rode that mare, and that's a high-powered mare that she was on, yeah. and she did a terrific job. You would never know that child had only been working with a horse for less than five days i certainly wouldn't as i said it's a testament to her teacher you and the the effects have have, it's amazing to see that like even being back home now a week later she seems more confident um not that she's necessarily struggled with that per se but she seems more grounded and and solid confident and um even more sensitive like i think that experience of just being learning to listen to those small signals um that she gets from that she got from Minnie, and then also to to communicate with those subtle signals it really like led to a kind of refinement that um i haven't seen anything else do and this is of course you know one of the reasons why we're having this conversation i just i think it's so powerful what these what horses can offer for kids Well, what's really interesting about this to me, because I'm learning every nanosecond that I'm out there, I'm I'm learning to empty my cup and be curious and go, oh my gosh, if something isn't working, what's going on? Is it here and within me? Am I missing something here? But when you have a child on a bra mare like that one, big, 1,200-pound, that's a big Mustang, okay? And she and that mare is trusting her completely to guide her through that course and those two are merging when she goes into another situation she had mastery mm-hmm. on a 12 to 1300 1200 pound horse at least through a comp, through a maze she can do it anywhere yes and i saw that she look can up. she can do it anywhere and she has to stop and make sure she's got all the information before she moves forward is has she read this situation correctly yeah and then she can go into it with the same confidence that she rode mini yes and i i saw that i was uh, you probably remember this i was you know down um watching w- one day and i saw and mini you know she just takes off <laughs> even when yeah, sylvie she, she she likes to run and so she just started taking off i saw this momentary look on sylvie's face of fear 
And then you were right there, of course, and she was totally safe. And then after that look passed, I saw her kind of like straighten up and she was riding bareback, by the way, not even in a saddle. And she then just got control of Minnie and, and, and then was able to keep riding. And that was, I think that was a huge moment for her um, to feel that fear and then to know that you were there and she was safe, but then to, to overcome it and, and know that she was equal to that. I mean, that, that's like you said, that, that can be taken out into so many different areas of life. It's a really important thing for the teacher also to know not only are students uh, the horses and to be absolutely present in the yes. moment, every moment that that child is on a horse and to be able to call out and know that Sylvia had had enough time on task to say, to, to understand when I said, bring that mare under Sylvie, bring that mare back, pull her down, pull her down. And she, she, I saw that instant also. Yes. And then she said, I can do this. And she, she brought that mare right back down. She collected her and brought her around. And that's when that grin went all over her face, <laughs> and, she, yeah. and she got it. She got yes. it. Yes. And because Minnie, I knew, would come back under, and I was there. I could pull Minnie back down, but she needed to do it. Mm -hmm. She needed to do it. And that's what happens. And that we have a wonderful young man here. He's about 14, and he's on the spectrum. And a year ago, he could do very, very, very little. And he went on his first trail ride with a colleague here uh, two days ago, and it was a joy to see this child able to saddle, bridle, and ride independently, yes. independent, language skills there, looking at, just exquisite. And the same thing with another student here who had some issues that is now independent and self-sufficient. Really a joy to see that happen with mm -hmm. these children, to go from no confidence to profoundly confident and skilled. Yes. So I want to switch gears a little here and, and talk more about skiing in a similar capacity. So you, uh, I think, um, during your, your master's thesis or after that created an, an approach called child-centered skiing, um, which really looks at skiing a, a more, a, a, a much more than just recreation. Um, so tell us a little oh, bit about how that came about and, and what that is. Uh, in graduate school, we had a very unusual Montessori program. We had a, 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 my professor, Dr. Peterson, uh, had graduated from Berkeley, and um, and actually her focus was cognitive development, Piagetian theory. And so when this program was created at St. Mary's, it incorporated not only the Montessori training, but also perceptual motor theory, cognitive development, learning theory, all of those combined. And so um, once I started to understand what was going on in cognitive development, perceptual motor theory, I realized that in order for ch for children to re to really function in the academic climate, you have to have on board the six fields of space: up space, down space, front space, back space, right and left, mm. the z-axis. Mm -hmm. Okay, the concept of understanding the concept of into put something into or between requires the ability to skip. Yes. The fundamental movement skills, walking, hopping, skipping, jumping, galloping, and sliding, all need to be in place beautifully for a child to really function in the academic world. Think about reading. Where does it go? Mm -hmm. Right? From left to right. What yeah. about math? Yeah. Top to bottom, left yeah. to right. Diagonals, verticals, yeah. all of that. Geometry. Okay. All of this require a knowledge of physical space the children left and right knowing that a, a friend who is sitting in their room his watch is on his left hand I'm sitting opposite from him how did I know that mm -hmm. I have to be able to take his perceptual position without losing mine to know what he has that knowledge isn't developed until the age of 11 and it is not being developed in this country much anymore because physical activity in interaction with nature is 
practically zip, zilch, nothing yeah. for yeah. many of these children. And so first you get laterality, which is knowing you're right and left. So we developed a color coding and skiing to develop that. And then I was able to bring that across when the children were watching other children in race course. And we had the race course coded in left and right. And those little five-year-olds were able to say whether it was a left turn or a right turn. Mm -hmm. Safety, of course, because we had developed that with them. And so I was fascinated with this. And, um, and also Montessori's focus that the children learn in direct interaction with the environment through their own activity and in no other way. Mm -hmm. It has to be physically oriented. Yes. It cannot be learned from a book. It has to, Children need that physicality. It's and so... also three to six-year-olds are in a period of the absorbent mind, so we need to connect them to nature. Yeah, it's and so fundamental. I mean, Sylvia... <laughs> Sylvia is, a, is in a Waldorf program, which, as you know, has a similar philosophy. And it's been fascinating to watch her learn math, for example. They they stand and, and kind of um, dance, essentially, and march and move. And they do these kind of synch synchronized movements while they're learning math. And she has learned math. <laughs> it's been amazing to watch how much faster she, they learn that way when it's embodied and, and the different ways they have such some so much of a deeper understanding of it like i remember when i was first learning and when you learn from a book when you learn it out of context you don't really understand all of the connections and how it fits together you might be able to memorize you know the multiplication tables and things like that but sylvie it, it's just been amazing to see the the depth of the understanding that develops when it's embodied like that you have to have mastery over your own body before you can do anything else. You, when you think about it, you have to have that large muscle coordination and then small muscle coordination of large muscles, which is key in skiing. But it's identical with the horse. You have to have the in skiing. It's interesting because it switches the focus from head down, center out to feet up. Mm -hmm. center out yes. very interesting so we developed with horsemanship you do have from head down center out but exactly the same movement you have to be able to roll that femur in to really grip that horse with the inside of your thigh you have to roll that femur when you're skiing to from from little toe to the inside ski to big toe on the outside ski upper and lower body coordination exactly the same and what it develops is a fine level of function that i you can't develop any other way it just doesn't another way doesn't happen. yeah <laughs> it's perfect um, and and i mean and i remember um that's okay. I was starting yeah. to take off on a tangent. I won't go. There. That's all right. I I wanted to um, <laughs> just pull pull you back to the skiing piece a little because it, it's truly <laughs> it's truly remarkable. I mean, I've seen a video which you sent me when we first met um, of you teaching some young, very you know, including very young kids to ski, and I was just blown away <laughs> by, by what I was seeing. And we're gonna we're gonna put the link to this video in the show notes for this episode. So if folks um, want to see some of the things that we're talking about, you can go to chriscresser dot com uh, slash another way, and we'll uh, mm -hmm. we'll have some links and stuff there for you to see. Um, but what what blew me away is there yeah there was it was it how 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 old was the youngest one Diane? well the, she, actually the youngest one was three but she wasn't there and her sister uh, was five they weren't there and they're equally as accomplished the youngest one there uh was four he's in the little red pants yeah. and then his sister yeah. six and then uh the eldest one there was seven and I don't teach a wedge. Yeah, they, I was going to say. You like, know the program. Yeah, you normally see. First. Yeah, you normally see kids that age just wedging, you know, down the, the oh, hill. No. And they, they might be going fast, but they're totally wedging. 
these kids were like ankles locked, parallel turning, bombing down the hill. I couldn't believe it. And when I watched the video, I showed it to my wife and, and we were all watching it. And I was like, what is happening here? How does this even work? And then you shared when I came to visit that you have a whole different method of teaching skiing, which skips the wedge entirely. So t tell us how this works. All right. I, as a result of my master's thesis at St. Mary's, I ended up writing a book for the Professional Ski Instructors of America called Child Centered Skiing, the American Teaching System for Children that integrated all of what I talked about earlier, which can be applied to anything, by the way. And that's what we did in applying it with the horses. But what I did is after when the when another way opened up, then I put the program here and I teach parallel skills. We studied World Cup level skiing, World Cup level skiing, to look at what needed to be in place there with the children. And then in the indoor environment, I give them those movements. I'm also, as you know, I've had about 15 years of Feldenkrais yes. background, though did not certify in that. So the movements that need to be there, the ability to roll your foot to big toe, flat to little toe, to be able to move the femur, watch the ankle roll and feel it move in the femur. We develop all of the skills that have to be present there with these two and a half. I will be working with a two and a half year old in about a week mm -hmm. and she will be doing parallel turns That's and I can amazing. develop all the parallel moves. Yeah. on the carpet, in front of the mirrors, and then I have a teaching aid where I can move them and they can develop the finesse right there on the carpet. And then once they have that, um, they come out and do the same moves on the practice slope, and then they go to the big resort, and they're already on the chairlift, right. and they're already, they start on on the you know, on the basic lift and then they're up on the top of the mountain. But I watch them very, very carefully, make sure we set them up in the equipment. We do a biomechanical ev evaluation. We make sure they're in the right boot. And if they have any kind of, uh, if they're too far to the outside or the inside, then we set them up with orthotics and we watch carefully right. because they're growing. And so we have to make sure that, we adjust those orthotics as they grow so that they're always centered, always on the sweet spot. And we make sure the skis are the right length. They adjust toe and heel, so we move them so they're always dead center. Mm -hmm. And those skis are meticulously maintained, just and, like an Olympic athlete, yeah, because that's how sensitive these guys are. And once they get the moves, you can put whoever they're skiing behind or with, they'll duplicate those moves. Right. And so we're working to get them now from this point with the finest skiers that are out there. And we do have some Olympic athletes that are connected with us. We had a ski coach um, see those children, and he said never did he know that children that young could do skills on that level. No. So they have a tremendous like flexibility tremendous yeah and, and just, just to i'm be... not saying i'm an olympic athlete but at least i got him to this point and now th this we'll be working next year to put that little group of children in front of somebody that has even better skills than well, i have diane you're too modest so you won't say this but i was shocked when we got there and you told me you were 78 years old because when you see in this video you're skiing with such fluidity and grace and i think that's also a testament to your method and you know that it doesn't just work for two and a half year old kids it also works for people works for us as as we age and grow older so we can protect our bodies and and take care of ourselves but i want to you're an infinite being my darling you're an infinite <laughs> being you can do anything you don't well want to do it's your mind that matters and yes. certainly bruce lipton and and a number of people would say it's and you know that Yes. It's what you, which in your mind that's most important, and then your little star suit will do as directed. <laughs> so I want you know for the listeners, I I have a picture of this in my mind, but they may not. So I want to <laughs> let everyone know that everything that you just described, the barn with the mirrors and all the skis, is right there on the property. It's it's yeah. right next to the tack room, which is across from the stables and where the horses are, which is across from the main building with the kitchen and the 
the, 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 where the kids are and they do their indoor learning. It's amazing to just be able to go from, you know, a, a lesson on math to doing something in the teepee and sitting together and in, in, in a circle and starting the day to, um, you know, taking care of the horses or doing a bit of riding to going in the building and practicing in front of the mirror and getting, you know, your parallel turns and then even going outside and going down the, uh, the, the little hill there to, to get that all on in one area and one facility, which is um, really, really remarkable. Again, what, what's there. It's really a joy to have it be that way because whatever's needed, you you can move to that area if that's fast. Like the other day, we're having an issue. So we used the um, Plains Indian Tribal Council model that I told you about with nice. a talking stick, and we go into that teepee and sage ourselves off, and they go there if they're having a problem. They go gather, gripe, grope, grasp, and group, and they mm -hmm. work through their problems together mm -hmm. and um, whether it's an issue with scheduling or horses or a conflict between with children we can move wherever is best suited to what is at hand the issue that is at hand and it's true it's really fun to have an environment set up that allows that total immersion experience yes. to happen yes so I, I, I want to move on to talk about a couple other elements of the Another Way model that we haven't discussed yet. But before I do that, I, my guess is there are some people um, in the audience who are listening to this. And, and, you know, I even had this thought as well before I learned more about this model. Like they're thinking, OK, skiing and, and equestrian. Well, <laughs> that's a little bit elitist, isn't it? Uh, you know, that's it's totally out of reach for most people. And it's skiing and horses are just for, for rich people. So what's what how would you respond to that well elitist maybe now but they were a way of life before yeah skiing mainly in norway but also here you know mm -hmm. the mountain men were doing that yeah. um horses were i mean look at horsepower without the horse would we have civilization I don't well, what you so. said to me is that it used to be that Poor people had horses and rich people had cars, and now it's the opposite. Right? It's the opposite. Yeah. Here, what the idea is, is about collaboration and cooperation. Yeah. It's about pooling our resources so that we can give the best of who we are to these children. Montessori had made a comment. She said, if ever the, the people really understood the tremendous power for good or evil in childhood, they would stop on for nothing to yeah. pour themselves into giving these children what they need and stepping out of the way because the pure, the children are just pure raw energetic genius yes. okay and we we put everything in a little box yeah. and school them to get into specific professions or whatever they're geniuses and if we can just provide an environment that encourages them and nurtures them and we can be curious and we can fire their passions and connect them. Nature is the inspiration for all the arts and sciences, mathematics, technology, everything, everything. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And it's, you know, in, in my profession in functional medicine, one of the basic tenets is it's far easier to prevent a disease or a condition before it occurs than it is to treat it after it's already manifested. And this kind of reminds me of that, like with childhood, of course, and education, it's way better to provide a solid foundation in everything that we're talking about for kids early on. That's more likely to prevent problems uh, in, in the teenage years and as young adults and even all the way through adulthood. But the way it's happening now in many cases is, you know, you have kids who are already feeling totally disconnected from the natural environment, from their own bodies, um, because of the way that school is set up and screens, which we're going to talk about more later. Um, but this approach is really about um, creating that, that deep connection to nature and self early on so they can carry that with them through their lives. Well, you had said something about, well, it's elitist and how do we do this? 
We provide the horses because we're here. The children can come in. We can provide scholarships for for children who might not Mm -hmm. otherwise be able to afford this. But we have the horses here. We're linked up with a trail system that is absolutely out of this world. Okay. So I can do, we can do the development right here, and then we can take them onto a trail system and connect them with absolutely stunningly beautiful places right here locally in Park City. Plus, we can t- then take them up in, into the Oantis for experiences. But we have the horses, so they don't yeah. have to, the parents don't have to go no, out and it, take it was very 50 affordable. to 150000 or more for a, high, for a horse. I mean, that's yeah. competing on the national yeah. level. Though, yeah. so if they want to compete, they can. There are programs here. There's a program out of Camus with a, a friend of mine, Diane Roberts, who it takes children all over the country in high-level competition, mm-hmm. children that would never be able to do that. Yeah. But the horses are provided, and, they, and, they, and they're taking these kids, if that's where they want to go. Yeah. Our thing is connecting when you are, come from the heart and are guided by spirit, there's always another way. That's a Sioux. That's a Sioux. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tradi- you know, a Sioux expression. Yes. And that's why actually the school was, the, there's a couple of the Lobbins who wrote all of the books that are used for Dances with Wolves, Into the West, all these these native programs. And they were friends of mine. Mm-hmm. And before they passed, um, Red said, I want you to call your school another way. Yes. When you're guided, when you come from the heart and are guided by spirit, there's always another way. When we're looking at the genius of childhood, we can come together and collaborate and provide what these children need. And it's the resources are all there for whoever needs whatever they need. Absolutely. The trucks, the trailers, the horses, it's, it's there. They're not having to do it in isolation. I saw we that can happening. Do it as a community. I saw that happening. And I mean, the camp was very affordable. And I know your ski programs are too. So I want to talk a little bit about, so, so far we've talked about the horses. We've talked about the native um uh, traditions as being a, a piece of it, the child-centered skiing, but there are a couple of other elements we haven't touched on yet. One is outdoor education and freelifslev. I think I'm pronouncing that somewhat closely. Oh, uh, freelifslev, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then the sac- the other one is um, frontier skills, the way of the wild. So let, let's start with outdoor education and freelifslev. Um, when Sylvie was at camp with you, she did horses and um, then they also went up to 9,000 feet and did some, you know, uh, ten. Out, outdoor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then 10, ten, ten was the second time. That's right. So, um, what, tell, tell us a little bit more about, you know, who's, who's been involved there. What is free loops live this very difficult word for me to pronounce. I think it's a Norwegian word. And, and what role does this play in the, another way framework? Um, free loose leave. It's a Norwegian program. It is used in Finland. It is the ground, it, it is the command center for their educational center. The, it's, it means it translates to free air life. Yes. And it's a nature-based philo- philosophy where Nor- for children in Finland, which has one of the highest academic ratings in in the country traditionally it's between one and three always and the children are happy and i think that's something we didn't really put in there's a joy from learning Mm -hmm. from your own activity in direct interaction with the environment with others that is joy it's fun the the children in finland are in these nature programs they're out in nature from two and a half to six, they don't even teach reading until age seven when binocular vision comes in and the children have had all these physical experiences and are skilled in the fundamental movement skills. By age six, they're skilled. They're really skilled. They're ready to rock and roll. And that nature program, that connection with nature is important because between three and six, is that period of the absorbent mind, the imaginal plasticity, where yes. you can join with whatever draws your attention, be it a tree, a, a, a little piglet, a horse, whatever. They can actually merge with that. And so um, Norway and Finland are big in that. And the interesting thing is, if people are interested in, in looking that up, 
go go look at those forest kindergartens, those forest schools. Yes. And they're they're phenomenal. And look at the joy in these children and look at the fact that the that Finland is on the top of its game academically and these kids are happy. They're not killing themselves. Yeah. They're it's not, not like committing you're, suicide. You're, you're not sacrificing academics for connection with nature. You actually get both. And there's this is the key principle that I think a lot of people don't understand is, you know, there's this idea in conventional education, like if things aren't going well, we'll just give them more homework, you know, or start them earlier with academic skills. And what's always struck me is that if you go even and look at the scientific literature on education, there's nothing there that supports that idea. That it's so mismatched, you know, even just the most conventional resources you look up on education, there is no proof at all that starting kids earlier on academics and giving them homework when they're really young not only does it not help, it actually harms. And so then you look at this model of free loose live, which I think is free air life, right, Diane? Mm -hmm. You look at this model and you see that not only are these kids developing a strong connection with nature, not only are they joyful and healthy because they're not sitting behind a screen the entire day, but they're actually coming out ahead of kids who start earlier in academics. I think a lot of people don't understand that. Well, it's really interesting if you go back 150 years, the level of competency in children, if you look at Meriwether uh, Clark and, and the, that whole bunch of founding fathers, yeah. those guys were out there for four oh, yeah. you know, c clearing out their traps and skinning their animals. They were five and six years old. Yeah. American Indians, those children were out watching the herds then. They knew how to use lives. They knew how to start a fire. They were independent and self-sufficient. On the ranch at um, six, my mom was teaching me to drive. The My cousins at seven and eight were on tractors, driving tractors. My cousin John was driving a truck. All oh, there would be 10 of us in that truck. And at, at five, we'd be out changing sprinklers. Mm -hmm. And he was driving, and the oldest of us was 13. I mean, right. even with us, we were, we were skilled beyond belief. Yeah. My cousin Bill was breaking colts for the Diamond K at, at age 10, he was working colts for a ranch about a quarter of a mile down the way. Yeah. So, I mean, we have really, if you look at some of the literatures out there, we have, we have retarded our children. Mm -hmm. We have retarded them, and we're boxing them and tracking them, and they are not happy. And they're also looking at the, you know, some of the stuff that we're doing environmentally that's all based on yeah, instant gratification and profit, and not thinking about like the Indians did. They made decisions under the seventh generation of all right. the unborn, yes. four-legged, two-legged, finned, winged, and that's what is happening in free loose leave more of really seeing that we are one with nature, We're not separate. What happens to nature happens to us. And we mm -hmm. think we're so smart. Well, who was here before us? The trees. So yeah, there. That's it. I quit. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so yeah, and then you have some amazing people involved with this. So I met a couple of them. I didn't get to spend as much time with Tom, but I met Ildiko, who is a former oh, Olympic my goodness, athlete, yes. Bob, um, bobsled driver, and 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 art Olympic ar archer as well, and used to shoot, uh, you know, do archery from a horse <laughs> riding at you know high speeds. Um, and in getting her PhD, I think, at the University of, uh, is it Utah? U yeah, University yeah. of Utah in yeah. kinesiology. She's Hungarian, and she is an Olympian. And then Tom is from Norway and was working with the original people in free loose leave. Uh -huh. And he ran the Norwegian Outdoor Center here for yes. 32 years, 18,000 at-risk kids. So yeah. Tom is here. Tom and Ildigo are teamed in the free loose leave program and she's bringing in her tremendous expertise yes. not only from wilderness training and from Europe in Hungary okay but also her her degree in um, at the U yeah. in kinesiology yeah, she's studying and, the impact of, of physical activity on stress yes. uh, stress hormones like interleukin 6 we chatted about that we had a great connection it was really fun to meet her um, 
and then t- let's talk a little bit about the frontier skills because that's oh my goodness. that's a whole nother piece and and um <laughs> I, you know we didn't get a chance to experience that this time but i'm looking forward to it in the future because sylvie as you know diane had you know shortly before we came to see you she had been at a wilderness camp um with you know a a, a, a deep um, Native American tradition and, and frontier skills. She learned to make uh, moccasins and shelters and track animals and people. And, and she just loved it. It was amazing to see how that affected her. Well, the, the, the children met in the teepee pretty much every, every day to do, to gather and, and greet the day and then look at where we were going and what we were doing. The, the primary thing with the, the, certainly the frontier skills is Joseph Campbell said this actually in the power of myth was, I was fascinated with that when he said the American Indians who were in a culture that was really steeped in blood. Okay. Yeah. Um, were evolving a highly spiritual way of life. that was rather rudely inter- interrupted by a pack of people coming over from Europe and the old world, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the idea was to study history, starting with the tribes and what they were evolving here and the skills and the knowledge base they had to give us, and then look at Europe and study what was happening in European history and understand what was behind that migration in 1492, what was happening in Europe that created that surge this way? And how did that clash of cultures take place? Because if you look at Europe, you had plagues, the bubonic plague. We had a mess in Mm -hmm. Europe. Maybe they had to leave, okay, and come over here. And we had two cultures that absolutely had no way of communicating with one another. They had absolutely no way. Innocence, okay, and a mess. And so now where we are, and Joseph Campbell said it was rather rudely interrupted, well, why don't we just get that one going again? Yeah. Okay? And we can bring those that knowledge base together with the incredible technology that we have. Instead of getting lost in virtual reality, Mm -hmm. we are Mm -hmm. going to step into what inspired it all. Yes. Okay? Because Montessori had very clearly stated that nature is the inspiration for all of it. And we are getting lost in tiny little puzzle pieces. We need to do what the American Indian said. Go to the position of the eagle. Yeah. Rise above the battleground and look down and see what's there and know that the only purpose for our little star suits is to extend love and answer cries for help. That's what we're about here. Yeah. And we can either, we've created a lot of wastelands. Why don't we create some wonderlands? And have fun doing it together. I'm on board. (laughs) So I I, want to um, ask you, you know, you've you've been doing this for a long time and the the more formal, you know, another way since 2004. So can you, you know, just give us a a, a couple vignettes or examples of kids who've gone through that program and, you know, what, where they are now, what they're up to, you know, what you've seen, how this has impacted kids' lives? Well, the, the children pretty much stay in touch. I just ran into a mom uh, at the local grocery store a couple of days ago, mm-hmm. and she said to me, it was extraordinary. Two of the twins, okay, um, are on a mission right now, mm-hmm. and okay. another one is in school, the three children that were here. And she said, of all the programs they were in, she said, the only school they remember, the only one they talk about all the time is Another Way. Mm-hmm. And she said, it, it's the most extraordinary thing because they had such an integrated experience that even when they left this school at nine to go on to a different program, they never forgot it. So I have one student in uh, the Midwest. He's finishing his graduate work. I have another uh, young uh, student. She just graduated from high school. She'll be going to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones are all over the place. at the University of Utah, the University of Virginia, San Luis Obispo, NYU Dubai. They're 
everywhere. And I stay in touch with their parents and with them. And they come by and often end up working in summer programs here. I have had teenagers here helping administratively in the office and doing scheduling. Um, we have teenagers here that are in their, uh, they're at the junior high, the, well, actually they're freshmen. But, so they're based at the junior high here and then doing classes at the high school that have been here all summer working nice. as yeah. volunteers with the program. And that's we amazing. have some that are seniors in high school. They stay connected they show up if I ask for help and I need their input. They're part of the, the they're part of the shirt wearers that are in the tribal council. Yes, yes. The teenagers are. So, another way has gone through some um, shifts and evolutions over time, as most organizations do, and <clears throat> now um, you've expanded it to. In- be a place where not just kids come together, but even teens and adults can participate in some of the activities together and families can participate as we did when we were there last time. And and I also understand that you're um, starting to consider a training program where you would pass on, um, you know, the work that you've developed in child-centered skiing and horsemanship um, to the next generation of people so that this amazing model can can be continued. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that vision? Um, in, in graduate school, when this was all coming together, I saw ultimately first the instructional program and then the book and the school and then a community mm-hmm. center. And that two years ago, the, there was a tragic thing that happened here with two teenagers who killed themselves mm. and they were um, heavily involved with designer drugs and the girls, the, the, the teenage girls that were their girlfriends and part of that group came and said, we would like to have something other than we have here. Could we have mentoring? Could we do apprenticeships? Could we learn how to do some of the things that we're doing here? Could we have a center that is practical that we could come and learn from people who are who are really skilled in their in their professions, and I I thought about that. Uh, hmm. And so two years ago, I made the decision that we needed to open this up mm-hmm. to uh, as a teacher training program, a mentoring program, and more of a community center because we have wonderful schools here. We have the incredible National Ability Center that does amazing work and we have beautiful schools but we have this nature connection and the Montessori connection that is really unique there how could we pool our resources and make what we're doing more available to the larger community and so I've been in a process of doing that over the last two years to sort out how to do this and um and making this a joyful experience for the people that are coming here and, and learning that, one, we need to educate those parents so when the children come here and experience this, yes. the parents understand what's going on yes. and that we're really building a, a, a core community. We're focused on building and maintaining relationships and doing that in a joyful fashion um, and passing this knowledge on passing this knowledge on and um, it, and it, we can make things available that instead of having it being elitist and isolated oh no 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 it doesn't... we have the means to pull this together so yes. that every child benefits from this yeah. every child has the opportunity to learn with these wonderful 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 mm-hmm. experiences and these wonderful materials and that the genius of the parents comes in here. This isn't, I mean, I'm the founder and the visionary that started this. I've been the executive director playing a one-man band. It is time for some other things to come into play here and let me start absolutely sharing these skills. The book, making that available and all the different parts of this, not yeah. just the skiing, not just the horses. It's an integrated whole. It's a seamless robe. And I want to be able to pass this on 
that benefits this entire community. Yes, and that's part Everybody. of why that's part of why we're having this conversation because I came, uh, we came as a family, and I w- we were also deeply affected by it. I just wanted to do whatever I could to get your vision and the work that you've done out there uh, into the you know a, a broader uh, awareness and, and a larger population, and and give people a sense of what's possible with all of these things put together for not only for childhood development, but for families and teens and adults. And you have, you, it's just amazing to see what you've accomplished, uh, you know, with significant help, but really, like you said, being a a one person band in the sense of, um, you know, uh, the buck stopping with you with just about everything. And, and I know there are people out there who are listening to this, who want to be involved in something like this. Uh, You know, we had, a podcast with Diana Rogers, who is making a film on the importance of animals in the food system uh, and the importance of including animal products in the diet. And, um, you know, she needed help raising money for the film. And there were she uh, we had an amazing response from people who were listening, um, in, including a, a, an extremely generous um contributor who who wrote a a significant check to help get the fun the film started and i just actually did my interview uh with diana for the film and it's it's well you know it's it's happening and so we never know who's who's out there and who wants to be part of something like this i mean i i know i i suspect that there are a lot of people that may want to support in some way because they this speaks to them. They 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 see our that our kids are suffering from this disconnection from nature and from, you know, spending seven hours on on average now uh, behind a screen, whether that's a computer or an iPad or a phone, uh, and the the angst and the sense of social isolation that this is creating, as you said, and for us to have something like this that. Um, provides a, a, a clear and proven model for helping kids develop a, an authentic and, and um, re- strong, real relationship with nature and themselves and their bodies, and, and which actually supports their academic development. Like we can't afford to um, lose this. And you know, you you're an amazingly healthy person, Diane. Seventy eight. I want to be like you when I'm seventy eight. Um, and it's like, you know, we all, we all die at some point and I, it's, this has to be, this work has to be passed on to the next generation. So I want to see this vision for a center where not only people locally in in Park City and other parts of Utah can come and participate in this, um, uh, uh, you know, but that people can come and train in these modalities and then bring that back to their own local communities. Like that's the the thing that really inspires me because it, you've got too much experience and knowledge in these areas to let, to let it go. Well, my dear, I made a commitment with all of this. Okay. That I would be here as long as I am needed, and then my star suit will dissolve and I'll be reassigned somewhere. But right now, the commitment is 100% here. And my dream in Utah with this incredible, incredible state is that we could bring people here and educate them, and they could go back to their community yes. with what they learned here instead of just paving Utah keep it wild and free and yeah. develop this differently. But what is what is really needed here in order to take this further definitely is what you were saying is the financial support. Yeah. It's being able to pull the team together that is developed here. Mm-hmm. Let us sit down and look at what we've put together here that works. Look at all of it, the things that didn't work, the things that do work. And we have models that work in each one. Of, we don't have to prove anything. It works okay and to be able to have enough backing to do the training Mm -hmm. ultimately bring us together to prioritize do the training for us and then create that infrastructure development so that this can operate year round year round and provide what is needed here absolutely so um it's we are in a position now where we've taken it I've taken it as far as it can yeah, go yeah. without bringing in more shirt wearers here. And if there are people in 
your um, constituency that would be interested, their expertise is vitally needed. Absolutely. This is the, this is the mo- if we want the Starship Enterprise, okay, we've got that original biplane. You want the Starship Enterprise, believe me, it's all there, but yeah. it's going to take us coming together and the, 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 it's all there. Yeah. The original yeah, model that... is there. Okay. And so we want to do an in-residence program here. We're going to need to have to develop the infrastructure. We've got an amazing, oh, amazing location. Yes. And we can bring in, um, I mean, goodness gracious, we have a native population here in Mountain Man. We have nowhere else. We have the university. We have all, everything we need right everything here, and we need. can pull this together yeah. in that in that tribal council. Yeah. And those people, those folks are shirt wearers like Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Okay, yeah. Sitting Bull said, "It's time for us to put down the guns and get together, and for the sake of the children." Yeah. He said that right before he yeah. left his star suit rather unexpectedly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. He said, we've got, and in fact, it's on the website. Sitting Bull is right there. He said, we got to put our minds together for yeah. the sake of the children and unleash this formidable. Think of, here's, a, here's a playful one for your, or maybe not so playful for our, you know, the people Listeners. who may be listening mm-hmm. to this. Look at the ages of the founding fathers during during the formation of this country. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. 9, I... 10, 11, 12, <laughs> yeah. 16, 17, 18. Yeah. The average age was 44, but if you look at the number of w- young men and women that were involved in this oh, yeah. and how powerful they were, we need to unleash that power. The greatest time of revolution is between ages 11 and 25. Mm-hmm. And what have we done with them? Yeah. We've separated them, isolated them, and put them in boxes. Yeah. These kids need to... We do not have separate grades here. These children are interacting from age three to age 14 at this school, well, 17, actually, yeah, yeah. with the ones that are coming in that have left that are in high school. Yeah. And you saw what happened with those two and a half, Absolutely. four and five-year-olds with those older children interacting. Yeah, so, I mean, Sylvie was helping the uh, two and a half year old to lead the miniature horse and lunge it. And, um, you know, it's it's amazing. She loves being in that role where she's the older girl. And then she really loved being around some of the teenagers that were there that were helping out, you know, and, and it's that kind of mixed age environment is so important. And this age segregation that goes on in schools, I just I, 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 I don't totally understand it but you know going back to what you said like this vision it's all there the resources are there the facility and the property is there the experience is there the people that are needed are there and what is needed now is just some more financial backing to make it possible and that you know that could be larger or smaller or it could also be in time commitments you know the the people to do you know to help as administrators we we need an executive director someone that can really um you know you are the visionary diane you you have the vision you're the knowledge holder the you've got this deep experience and it's not it generally doesn't work for that person to also be the person who is making sure all of the logistics are handled and you know taking care of brass tacks so to speak um I, even in my company i'm i play the role of the of the visionary and, and the ambassador and i have uh what we call them an, an integrator executive director type of people that are making everything happen and that's really the best structure and so we, we need that as well and uh, if you're interested in being a part of this in any way um just stick around and listen f- uh, for for the ending here we'll give you some ideas for how you can get involved and help out um so you know li- stick around and listen to the end of the show because i'm going to record that separately we're still working that out at the time of this recording and i trust as i know you do diane that you know when the when the time is right and you put this thing out into the universe uh, and the need is there that it will be supported and i know there are some amazing people who are listening now who are probably getting really excited about uh, being a part of this in, in some way. Well, I remember, I, I love the movie, The Field of Dreams, Build It and They Will Come. And I also loved Pay It Forward. And so that's always 
been part of this and what the kids feel too. And so we're just giving our level best and know that at this point it will receive what it needs. We know we need to do the training. We know we need to gather people. We know we need key things and infrastructure to make it so that it can be a totally integrated whole where people can do an Mm in-residence program here. Mm -hmm. And that's core. They need to step into it. We already have support from elders and what we're going to be putting in more with a native, with a native, you know, that where the TP yes, is. Yes. And, and of course we have not only native American sport, we have the whole mountain man contingency and certainly led by, um, Chris Swanson with sharp knife blanket, who is just writing a, a book, by the way, that's coming out on the influence of women during the fur trade time. Okay. So, um, that we need some support and we need some shirt wearers in here too that can come in and look at what we're doing. I'm uh, downloading the book right now Mm -hmm. so that that can be available and we can document this because once the children have the physical experience, then they can take technology, which is more two dimensional and they can bring the whole experience into what they're watching. Exactly. If children don't have that core touch experience, then when they watch a video, it, it, it is only partially connecting, usually yeah. goes right out the window. But if they have the core experience, then the video is something else entirely. Yeah. and Entirely. You know, I forget who said this, but um, technology uh, makes a great servant, but a poor master. And Very poor master. It, this Very is the, master. the foundation that kids uh, need in order to avoid technology becoming their master which is unfortunately happening so often so diane thank you so much for sharing your time and your vision with us and for being who you are i'm i'm so um glad to say that i am a shirt wearer now and i want (laughs) to i want to um play you know whatever role that i can in, in making this um to you know move to the next level because it's it just it unite so many different things that I'm interested in and my passion um, as my listeners know for for kids and childhood development and making sure that we give our kids the 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 resources and the support that they need to develop into the who they really are um, as human beings and live you know um, happy joyful connected lives and thank you so much for for doing this work and dedicating your life to this. Well, thank you for finding us and supporting us and for extending the love and trusting us with that beautiful child of yours. Mm. Give Sylvia a hug. I will. Take care, thank Diane. You, thank you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. If you're feeling inspired by what Diane has put together at Another Way School and Community Center and want to get involved, Visit chriscresser.com slash another way, all one word, to learn more. If you live in Park City or the surrounding area or you visit there regularly and you have kids, consider enrolling them in one of the programs at Another Way. The winter ski program with Diane and other teachers is now enrolling students. You can see the video we talked about in the podcast with Diane skiing with the kids to get a sense of what's possible right here on this page. Diane's child-centered approach to skiing, which emphasizes kids' connection to nature and their own bodies, is a unique and powerful method of teaching, and if you watch the video, you'll see what I mean. There are also programs in outdoor education and free lutes live, mindful horsemanship, frontier skills, and nature-based Montessori education. Again, go to chriscresser.com slash another way and let us know what you're interested in and someone will contact you. We're also looking for people who can support the continued growth and development of Another Way, whether that's through a financial contribution or by volunteering or by offering other resources. Another Way has tremendous potential to bring more joy, fulfillment, and healing to our kids and teens, not just locally in Park City, but around the country and the world by training other teachers to bring this work back to their communities. As you can imagine, developing a robust training program and infrastructure like this is a major undertaking, so we're seeking help from all of you. I've become involved myself. I'm a shirt wearer, as Diane puts it, because I believe in the vision, and I think now we need it more than ever. 
We need these kinds of programs to help our kids reconnect with their bodies, with their communities, and with the natural world. Over the last several years, the incidence of chronic disease and especially behavioral issues like ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, oppositional defiant disorders, sensory processing disorders, etc., is exploding. And I've come to see many of these conditions as a consequence, at least in part, of our disconnection from our evolutionary heritage. Not just our diet, but also the way we live, our social networks, including elders in our community, our relationship or lack thereof with nature, the amount of time we spend on screens and more. This really is the disease of our time and our kids are suffering tremendously from it as we are as adults. So the treatment, so to speak, has to be much more than just changing our diet and taking supplements. We have to reevaluate our way of being and how we approach our lives. And this is what Diane and her team at Another Way are doing and it's why I'm supporting them. So if you feel inspired to get involved in some way, whether that's enrolling your children in the ski or horsemanship program, or possibly training as a teacher in any of these approaches, or supporting the continued development of the training programs and the school financially, visit chriscresser.com slash another way, another way is all one word there, to get in touch. That's chriscresser.com slash another way. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.